coming towards the boat. Quick. Battling a boat. super sea beast and its killer sword. Fast. All ahead full. All ahead full. Oh, oh what a fish. A lot of Wrestling a whopper ray with a venomous whip. Be careful of the sting, right? Wrangling 600 volts of electrifying eel. I was about to fall in the water with the eel because it's just the sheer force of it pulling me in. And a surprise showdown with a prehistoric chainsaw. Oh it just swings around, and if it hits anything, it's going to dig in very, very deep. In extreme encounters of angler versus mega predator, these underwater hunters wield lethal arsenals. It's hooked, deadly weapons. Whoa. Oh my god. Super predators rule the depths with extreme and dangerous adaptations. Swords built to kill. Flesh spearing venom barbs. Electric charges strong as tasers. Beyond biting teeth, these are the killer arsenals of the deep. And for some extreme fishermen, taking on these alpha hunters is the ultimate thrill. A battle of man versus armed monsters. There he is. Oh, okay. Whoa. The ocean's alpha hunters have ancestors ripped from science fiction with deadly weapons to match. Meet the monstrous in Moldham Beat in the first fucking of the industry. Hey, it's me and Zuck. Nick via the sea, they're some of the ocean's scariest saber wielding predators. Swordfish. For one angler, a 50-year obsession to battle a record breaker turns into the fight of his life. Make it ahead! May 27, 2003, the Bay of Islands, northern New Zealand. In one of the most remote fishing meccas on earth, devoted amateur angler Jerry Garrett sets out with his fishing buddy Jeff Stone and Jeff's girlfriend Heather. Their target, Whopper Swordfish. Since Jerry's first swordfish catch in 1950-ish on Earth. Very powerful fish, and one that is the quest of every big game. It has all the characteristics of almost impossibility. It's a cross between a marlin and a big bluefin tuna. Combine the two and then give it a dose of steroids and a, and a six-month course in the gym, and then put a hook in it and try to stop it. 15 million year old evolutionary powerhouses, swordfish can grow nearly 15 feet long, weighing almost three quarters of a ton. Fast as cars, they can swim up to 50 miles an hour. But their most fearsome weapon is their sword like snout. This jagged, jutting blade is actually an extended jawbone. Stretching about a third of a swordfish's body length, their lethal bills can jut as long as five feet. With a rounded tip, the blade's top side flattens out much like a bird's beak, creating sharp edges. Incredibly, swordfish have no teeth. To hunt, they rely entirely on their swords. Basically swimming into a group of fish, slashing it from side to side, and any of the fish may become stunned or cut or injured like that, at which point the swordfish can swim back and eat them at its leisure. And when the hunter becomes the hunted, a swordfish's bill is a powerful defensive weapon. If you're a shark trying to attack a swordfish and you're getting slashed and stabbed at, then you're going to think twice about attacking. Yet not long ago, these tenacious predators nearly disappeared from the planet. In the 1990s, swordfish populations reached dangerous lows. Global conservation has helped the fish recover. Today, swordfish are on the rebound. 
Using responsible practices, adventure anglers can once again test their strength and skill against these sword-wielding hunters. Now in the boat, Jerry Garrett and his team head deeper into swordfish territory. Come on, y'all, back and get the thing in. They catch local skipjack for bait. You ready? Ready. Okay, to reach a swordfish lair, Jerry targets an area more than 1,500 feet below the boat. You're getting close to the stern, Jeff. Give us the L when you get to 500, Doug. How deep is it on the gauge? 500. Uh, we stopped. Something's happening. All right. He feels a powerful tug. I got him hooked now. It's a bite. I lost all the weight. From the weight and pull of it, Jerry thinks it's a swordfish. Pull it drag up and make The angler jumps into the fighting chair. Fast! All ahead full! All ahead full! This is getting awful close. Heather works Jerry. frantically, get trying warning. to get baited get lines get out of the way. Okay, right, let's get this other bait up out of the water. But the catch right, has other plans. Up. Something's wrong. I don't have enough it's weight on it. It's coming towards the boat. Quick! We don't want it under the Take boat. Take it ahead! Take okay, it ahead! I've got the other line out of the motor. Take it sir. ahead! Wayne, come on! Jerry's plan is to tire the fish. Yet as he fights, the angler worries the fish may tire him. The fish was very strong. The difficulty of landing them after a period of time, having the stamina to stay with the fight. Stamina is only one of Jerry's worries. At any moment, the fish could slash the line with its blade. The leader is, of course, very taunt at that point because of the amount of pressure that I had on the line. So it made an easy target to be sawed through. Keep going, Jerry. Keep going. Keep going. As Always the fisherman fights to stay hooked, he has no idea how big his catch is. Jerry and his team manage to keep the taut fishing line intact. Okay, we got the double. Yeah, he's giving it up. He's just floating there. He's just sitting there. But now, deep into there. hour 13, Jerry's struggling to stay alert. Incredibly, the exhausted angler reels against the fish for another hour and 20 minutes. He still hasn't had a glimpse of his powerful opponent in the flesh. Then, in a sudden burst, an enormous sword slices through the water. Holy guacamole, what a fish! The team is stunned. Oh, what a fish! It's the biggest swordfish any of them have ever seen. Keep going. We're almost to the nylon. Its slashing weapon is close enough to touch. Give me the gaff, Heather. Give me the gaff. Okay, give me the gaff. Give me the gaff. Holy guacamole! That's when things were very exciting and yelling, and I got out of the chair, unbuckled myself from the fishing tackle, and grabbed the sword. Grabbing hold of a swordfish bill is extremely dangerous. In addition to flesh-cutting bony edges, swordfish bills are covered in septic bacteria. Jerry's ultimate catch is in reach. But the real battle against the swordfish and its deadly weapon has just begun. The fish swung the head and knocked me across the cockpit got it, into got the it, side. Got it. Oh, I just sat there and said, oh, I'm not going to try that again. Seeing it up close, the whopper billfish stretches longer than a surfboard. He's big, all right. Jerry thinks it may be a record breaker. Let's get out of here. But it's too large and dangerous to pull on board. Yep, plug it off. The team decides to tow it to the nearest harbor. Steaming into their home port, Jerry's 50 year obsession is at stake. We came into the wharf with my flag flying that I bought in 1959 when I caught my first swordfish. And we proceeded with the weigh in process. The catch stats are stunning. The swordfish weighs 813 pounds, stretching 12.8 feet long. It's a world record. 
to be able to actually land one of some size is a feat that very few worldwide big game anglers have accomplished. 14 hours and 20 minutes behind those controls is really a lot longer than I wanted to be there, but just great. Just, just mind-blowing. One of the deadliest underwater weapons is literally shocking. Electricity. Many fish can detect electric fields, but only a few can generate a powerful field of their own. And one is an apex predator. Tough to find and even tougher to catch, its lethal weapon is measured in voltage. The electric eel. For one daring angler, wrangling this electrifying beast is the ultimate Amazon adventure. May 15, 2010, Amazon Base in Peru. Deep in the rainforest, Anthony Giardinelli runs an expedition lodge. Anthony leads clients through the untamed jungle. But for him, one of the most extreme tests of skill is the hunt for the electric eel. Randy, desata la soga. Vamos a agarrar este pez eléctrico. Able to grow more than six feet long, weighing over 40 pounds, surprisingly, electric eels aren't actually eels. They're part of the knife fish group, species named for their sleek blade-like bodies. Yet in the jungle, these elusive, electrifying predators are more often mistaken for killer snakes. If you're not looking really good, if you're not really close and you see it, you could easily confuse it for something like an anaconda. But unlike anacondas, the electric eel kills with a shocking weapon. The prey of the electric eel is zapped by the electricity, at which point the muscles and nerves all start firing and go into a contraction, which basically paralyzes the fish. Electric eels electrify themselves, literally turning their bodies on and off. Inside the eel, flat disc-like cells called electrocytes carry electrical charges. To activate them, all it takes is the right conductor, salt. By controlling the levels of salt coursing through their muscles, electric eels work like living batteries. The bigger the beast, the more lethal the charge. The largest specimens can generate as much as 650 volts. Wielding their weapon like a taser, Electric eels stun fish, amphibians, even birds, and small mammals. Once they've stunned their prey, they swallow it whole. And even more remarkable is what they can do to predators. They can deliver shocks for an hour or more if they need to, so even if a crocodile or a large catfish or something else is trying to attack it and thinks it can wait it out, that's not going to work. The electric eel can defend itself for long periods of time. Electric eels never deliberately attack people. Yet, accidental contact can kill. The biggest danger from an electric eel is getting into the water, getting zapped, falling unconscious, and then drowning. There's a lot of drowning deaths in the Amazon are blamed on electric eels. For Anthony and his co-worker Randy Kawachi, the thrill of the catch outweighs any danger. The men head towards a nearby tributary, a known electric eel habitat. Electric eels are notoriously difficult to detect. These ambush predators instinctively hide under river vegetation. The team locates their target spot. But to position themselves, they have to hack their way with a machete. Mm. 
The anglers used two strategies. They lower the bait under dense plants and they agitate the surface to attract attention. But hours go by with no bite. Anthony decides to change location, moving deeper into the tributary. To get there, the men must hike into the jungle. At a secluded stream, Anthony and Randy bait and tickle the surface with their fishing poles. Randy, no hay nada por ahí. Nada todavía. In a sudden rush, a fish bursts out of the leaves and grabs onto Anthony's hook. The gigante pez eléctrico. It's a giant electric eel. Tiene dos metros, Randy. Randy, me. Come on. The electric eel has an extraordinary fighting strategy. The other fish swim away with the hook in their mouth going away from you. This was was corkscrewing away with his head here pulling out and it was just very strong. Many fish can undulate their bodies, but this Amazon giant can actually contort itself like a rope. When it found some trees that were still in the water, it would wrap around the trees and use that as leverage to keep pulling away. It felt literally like you're tugging with another rope. With so much dense vegetation, the line could easily sever or tangle. Anthony has to reel in the catch as fast as possible. Swimming fast, the eel changes direction. Anthony struggles to keep the writhing fish hooked and follow it on the muddy ground. To ward off an electric charge, the angler wears protective rubber waders. But in the slippery mud, he must be careful. He's only five feet from the agitated eel. As the fight continues, if Anthony falls, he could get zapped by 600 volts. Just the sheer force of it pulling me into the small channel. And I was about to fall in with the eel. Struggling against the fish's corkscrew pull, the fisherman manages to secure better leverage on drier land. <laughs> Anthony uses all of his energy to reel the beast up and out of the water. <laughs> On the bank at last, it's one of the largest electric eels Anthony's ever seen. The Whopper knife fish measures six feet, three inches long, weighing over 30 pounds. <laughs> Anthony wants to release the catch back into the main river, but it's a daunting challenge. Any touch could trigger an electric shock. A protective bag must cover the fish at all times. As a further precaution, the men hang the eel from a stick. Watching the enormous eel slide back into its Amazon lair, Anthony's thrilled. It was probably one of the most sensational fights I've ever had. In a fearful legacy of armed fish, one of the most ancient is a 300 million year old shark. The Stethacanthus. This spiked fin may have been a terrifying ramming and thrashing device. Today, another fearsome shark is the ocean's ultimate kickboxer, the Thresher. Its deadly weapon? One trauma. Come on, Steve! But one tournament team is determined to battle a Thresher shark in the flesh in an extreme showdown of man versus sea beast. September 9th, 2006, Portland, Maine. Steve York joins his friends Mike and Bob Susie for the two-day Casco Bay Shark Tournament. On the tournament's first day, Mike and Bob spotted a huge thresher shark in the waters. 
Now, with less than a day remaining in the competition, they're back out on a mission. So it's pretty cool. It's actually quite amazing to target a uh, shark and then go out and actually find. Uh, it was pretty amazing because the thresher sharks are very rare up here. Massive and deadly, the thresher shark can grow as long as 20 feet, weighing up to 750 pounds. But the thresher's most remarkable feature is a tail as long as its entire body. A thresher shark looks like a typical shark that someone came and pinched the tail and then pulled it out. A thresher shark's tail is powered by muscle and flexible cartilage. Against both predator and prey, it's an assault weapon as strong as a club. They can crack the tail and try to stun or kill the prey, at which point they can come back and eat the prey with ease. Oh, he's pissed. For anglers, thresher tails can make these powerful sharks impossible to catch. If you don't keep constant pressure and keep that line tight, he can get his tail around the line and break you off that way with the power of that tail. Whoa. Oh my god. The Casco Shark Tournament team is determined. On board, Mike Susie throws right chum into the water. Then, there's a tug. Come on, Steve, let's go, let's get the lines in. Come on, let's go. The team's smallest fishing rod springs to life. All right, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Get the belt Steve, on, you're Steve. up. Get the belt on, get the belt on. Steve grabs the rod and his fight belt. Immediately, the angler fears he's in trouble. The gear oh, is no match for the beast. I was not prepared for how much line they took and how powerful using uh, the rod that we had for that shark was kind of small for shark fishing, definitely for a shark that size. Steve can only guess what kind of shark he's hooked. Blue sharks are the most common off the main coast. Yet the catch isn't behaving like a typical deep diving blue. It okay. takes off in a straight run. Real, Steve. Real. Real. Then, 300 yards from the boat, a sudden splash reveals just how big the beast is. Look at that fish. The water, twice. Real. With less than nine hours left in the tournament, the team thinks they may have hooked the winning shark. But now, the Titanic Thresher is headed directly towards them. Coming right at the boat, Bobby. Let me back down. The shark came right at the boat, started to go down a little bit, and then slammed the side of the boat with his tail, and just a loud whack, and it went under the boat. And I'll never forget Mikey's expression. That was a close one. I think we need a bigger boat. Two and a half hours into the fight, there's a problem. The bait is sliding bait the up line. the line. Bait on the line, bait on the line. Steve, we gotta get the bait off that line. All right. Bobbing at the surface, it's attracting other sharks. If a hungry shark bites through the line, the catch is lost. Brian, Brian. The team needs to cut the bait loose with a knife. One wrong move, and they'll lose the giant thresher and the tournament. With only five and a half hours left in Maine's Casco Shark Tournament, Steve York and his two-member team have a giant thresher hooked. It could win the contest. But now, as other sharks move in, the anglers have to cut their bait loose without severing the line. When we finally got him close enough, Mike was able to reach onto the fish and actually cut the fish away from the line very, very gingerly, of course. Real, real! The battle's far from over. Incredibly, Steve fights the shark for two and a half more hours. Keep it going, keep it going, come on. It's grueling, but the oh, fisherman refuses to give up. Come on, Steve, reel. Come on, come on, I keep it going. At last, the thresher shark begins to tire. Steve manages to get the monster fish near the boat. He can't believe his eyes. I'd never seen one until that day, so uh, it really gets your attention when you see it coming out of the water so big. Get the gap. It's far too big to bring on board. Okay, line. The team go. must tie the beast to the side. As they scramble to lasso it, the thresher unleashes its weapon. It's just slamming the side of the boat with its tail. 
With less than three hours to the tournament weigh-in, the anglers managed to tie a second line. At the weigh-in, the team's hunch was right. It's the Casco tournament's winning shark. The thresher measures 17 feet long, weighing a whopping 628 pounds. A main state record. When we get to the scales and find out how much it really weighed, uh, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I just wasn't prepared for that. It was great. A biologist on site takes measurements and collects organ samples, gathering valuable data to help fisheries study thresher populations. Heavily regulated tournament catches are few and far between. The real threat to sharks worldwide is a practice known as finning. You catch a shark, you cut off the fins, the shark may be dead or alive, it doesn't always matter. And then you keep the fins and they command a very high price in certain markets for shark fin soup. Uh, the rest of the shark is usually not very valuable, uh, relatively speaking, and is usually just dumped right back overboard as garbage. Efforts to stop finning are helping preserve the thresher and other shark species, protecting some of the planet's most amazing weapon-wielding predators. Among the ocean's armed hunters is an ancient beast with a venomous whip. The Stingray. One daring angler is determined to battle this poisonous beast from shore, even if it means risking his life. September 6, 2009, Mossel Bay, South Africa. Jacques Duploy and his friend Peter Norcha are devoted rock and surf fishermen. The treacherous technique involves hooking a catch from shore and wrestling it in the rocky surf. For Jacques and Peter, the ultimate conquest is a giant stingray. If you compare the stingray and its flattish body with, for instance, a shark with its uh, more streamlined body, I say that the stingray might not be as fast, but it's got the power and, and the torque to make up for it. Lethal ocean flyers hunting stingrays skim the sandy floor, sucking up prey with stealthy speed. But don't let their grace fool you. These prehistoric shark cousins are some of the ocean's most powerful behemoths. One of the biggest is the short-tailed stingray. It can get up to 7 feet across, 14 feet long, and weigh up to 800 pounds. And it's arguably one of the largest stingrays on the planet. To avoid predators, the stingray burrows into sand. Yet when camouflage fails, it whips out an agonizing weapon. A venomous barb called a sting. There are grooves running along the base of the sting, and in these grooves are venom glands. The sting normally is covered with skin, so you don't always see the serrations, but they're there. When it is attacked, the stingray will drive the sting into the attacker. The serrations open up the wound. The venom glands get ripped open, and poison goes into the wound. Lashing out its whip-like tail, a stingray injects a protein-based toxin. The venom attacks the nerves, heart, and circulation. The venom itself isn't lethal, but an attacker pays a painful price. The primary symptom is extreme pain. It also has uh, consequences in that it can uh, affect the heart rate, the blood pressure of the victim. That's short term, uh, cause nausea, vomiting, and a lot of other symptoms. To humans, the stingray's most dangerous weapon is the barb itself. The pointed tip can rip through organs and arteries, causing instant death. Now, on shore, Jacques and Peter set up their fishing gear. Peter, I'm going down to coast. I'll see you now, eh? Okay. One of the biggest rock and surf challenges is the cast. We have to make a cast of a minimum of 100 meters to allow us to get into the zone where, where fish is feeding. 
The men set their rods and scan the water, manning their lines in the sweltering South African heat. <clears throat> now it's quiet now. I hope we get another pickup. It's very quiet. Then, one of the rods gets a tug. Jacques' wheel peels out line in the blur. The angler jumps up and grabs hold. Taking a lot of line, eh? He can't see what he's hooked, but he can feel its power. I was fighting it as hard as I could. I know I was stretching my tackle to the limit, and I really wanted to land this one. The fish makes a sudden right turn. Oh no, it's going to the reef now. It's going to the reef, Jock, and stop us before it's in the reef. It's headed fast, straight towards a shoreline reef. It's a rock and surf angler's worst nightmare. Once the fish have uh, reached that uh, reef, it will swim over it and dive down, and it will sever that front part of your line on the reefs. Jacques stops the spooling line at 650 feet. He hopes a tight leash will keep the fish from swimming over the reef. But Jacques miscalculates. Jacques, where's it? Where's it? Where? I see a tail. I see it there, but it's I nothing it. it's I can huge. do. It's a huge tail. I can see it. I can see it's on the reef. It's already on the reef. It's a massive short tail stingray. Jacques tries to reel the fish into deeper water. But it's too heavy. I'm just going to hold it there. Then he gets a stroke of luck. Three or four waves came through, and that force of the waves pushed the fish off the reef, and it was on our side of the reef again. The angler keeps tension on the line, fighting pain in his arms. Peter, it's getting closer to the side. Can you run down and grab the leader? It's coming, eh? With a strong yank, Jacques gets the stingray close to him. Yet not close enough. I didn't have a choice. I had to go down closer to the rocks to avoid the line or the leader being snagged in the rocks right in front of us. When I was running over that rocks, I had to be careful. Jacques reaches the ray. Up close, it's far bigger than the fisherman expected. Just be careful. It's huge. It's, it's coming, coming, Jacques. It's coming. Be careful of the sting, eh? Oh, it's huge. Harder even than reeling it in, the real challenge is landing it. Jacques' friend Peter is ready to help wrangle the massive sea beast. But the stingray's too huge to lift. Their only hope is to catch the perfect Just wave. The wave. Just wait for the right wave to pull it up. Just wait. The longer Jacques and Peter wait, wait. the wait. more they're Just in danger. The, pull it. the catch could strike back with a stabbing oh, yeah. tail. With a giant short-tailed stingray corralled in a South African reef, Jacques Deploy and his friend Peter Norja try once again to wrestle the fish ashore. At all times, they keep the raised lethal weapon in sight. Gathering their strength, riding the waves, Here comes a big wave. the men manage to get the stingray to shore. Pull it! Wow, it's huge, eh? That's a beautiful fish, huh? Your first one. It's my first one. At first we were in awe. We look at this fish because we didn't realize it was this big while fighting it. We knew it was a big fish, but we haven't seen one like this before, uh, of this size. Jacques wants to release the fish safely. He knows time is critical. The men take fast measurements. The giant ray stretches over six and a half feet. Point one meter. To calculate weight, the anglers submit measurements via text message to a fish database. Minutes later, the results are astonishing. Look, it's a nice fish, Jock. Well done. Uh, well done. The ray weighs 575.4 pounds. It's the largest stingray ever caught in South Africa. Working quickly, Jacques and Peter use the waves to nudge the mammoth beast back into the Indian Ocean. short tail stingrays aren't officially endangered, but catch and release helps protect their populations for future encounters of man versus whopper, whip-tailed ray. A 
Among weapon-wielding sea beasts, one extinct species looked truly petrifying. Helicoprion. This 300 million year old monster may have used its jaw like a tooth covered lasso. Today, there's another jaw dropping fish on the prowl. Combine shark, stingray, and swordfish into one astounding hunter, and it can only be the sawfish. This bizarre behemoth sports one of the ocean's strangest looking weapons. But as sawfish fight for species survival, one extreme catch turns into a rescue mission. May 26, 2009, Fort Myers, Florida. Eddie Alsop, his wife Jessica, and friend Matt McCarran are fanatic amateur anglers. They usually catch local fish like tarpon. But today, they're about to encounter an elusive ancient beast. I've been here my entire life. I've known lots of people that go fishing, and there's only a handful of people that ever have seen a sawfish. Meet a mega predator that dates back 50 million years. The biggest sawfish can stretch longer than 20 feet, weighing as much as a great white shark, over two tons. A bizarre blend of different species, sawfish are some of the most unique hunters on the planet. Technically, they're actually rays, like stingrays, but they look more like sharks or a flattened shark, except that the snout has been drawn out into a saw shape with teeth running up and down the side. Basically, it looks like a giant shark with a chainsaw attached to it. Surprisingly, this striking chainsaw blade works as both a weapon and an antenna. The blade is called a rostrum, and these tooth-like structures are in large scales known as dermal denticles. The entire rostrum is actually covered with dermal denticles and sensors called electroreceptors. The receptors pick up signals from living prey. Once a sawfish senses prey, it goes in for the kill. It can use the saw to go through a school of fish and slash it back and forth, and then it can go back and eat any of the fish that it may have killed or injured. Sawfish get so big, they have few predators. But if attacked, their saw becomes a defensive dagger. This is probably one of the reasons that the adults are not usually attacked by sharks. It can actually turn around and defend itself. Yet these prehistoric survivors are highly threatened, listed as critically endangered. In the last century, it's estimated the world's sawfish population has declined 95%. The greatest danger to sawfish are actually fishing nets. Because of all the teeth, they accidentally swim into the net, get all tangled up, and it is incredibly difficult to get them out because they're big, powerful fish thrashing around. And usually the sawfish doesn't survive the encounter, at least historically, because it was just easier and safer for the fishermen to kill the sawfish. In the U.S. and Australia, it's illegal to catch or kill sawfish. To help populations rebound, biologists are in a race to understand sawfish behavior and migration. Fishermen are instructed to report any sawfish encounters and to cut the line free immediately, safely releasing these endangered predators at all costs. But as these Florida fishing buddies head out on the ocean, no one's expecting a sawfish encounter. Jessica and Matt have landed a few tarpon, and now, a large hammerhead shark is circling. Wow, look at that. Look at that hammerhead. Oh my god, it's huge. It's huge. Awesome. Fish on, hey, fish, fish on. on, fish on. Grab it, grab it. You're up, you're up, buddy. Eddie gets a bite. Hopefully it's that big hammerhead. <laughs> yeah, he it's just a went big by. fish. He just went by. Oh my gosh. Yep, I'm gonna need a belt. belt. He assumes it's the hammerhead. But as he straps on his fighting belt, he's shocked at what he feels. We're going to catch a big shark. Oh. Compared to other fish, it was very oh. strong. It was like fighting a Mack truck. The fish is so forceful, it's yep. stripping line faster than Eddie can stop it. The angler has no idea oh. he's hooked a prehistoric predator oh. that's about to wield its weapon. Hopefully it's that oh. big hammerhead. After setting out for yeah. a typical day's fishing, Eddie and Jessica Alsop 
and fishing buddy Matt McCarran are battling an unknown Goliath. I had to put both my thumbs on the reel to stop it from taking all my line off. If it would have run out of line, it would have snapped the line. We would have lost a fish. Eddie's convinced it's bigger than any fish he's ever encountered. As soon as he gains a few feet of line, the powerful whopper yanks it back. He's burning me again. Feels like a big old, big old fish. 30 minutes into the fight, the beast changes strategy. It starts circling, getting closer to the boat. Hey, he's coming around the boat. Don't get hooked up on that motor. Walk to the back, walk to the back. Good job, babe, good job. The angler races across decks, trying to keep the fish free from the anchor line and the motor. Here he goes, he's going back to the front now. Then, something strange happens. It went down and laid on the bottom, and I really had a hard time getting him to move off the bottom. He was like stuck, like a big rock. Eddie's baffled. What he thought was a hammerhead is now acting like a stingray. No, the thing's just locked on the bottom right now. I can't get him to move. Bring him up. Eddie's anxious to see what he's hooked. With a massive heave, he reels the catch to the surface. I've almost got him. He's coming up. Oh, we're gonna bring this thing up soon. Sausage. Get the f out. Oh my god! It's a big one! It's one of the most fearsome weapons the anglers have ever seen. This giant saw lifted out of the water and it was huge. It was a monster. It was like a dinosaur pulling a dinosaur out of the water. And if it just swings around and if it hits anything, it's gonna dig in very, very deep. Holy f Oh my god! Uh, we need to get this line. Just They've hooked a Goliath sawfish. This is the coolest thing ever. Oh it's a massive Never. one, too. Comparing the catch to the you boat, the team enormous. estimates the prehistoric beast stretches roughly 15 feet. Its serrated saw blade alone it's jutting four back. feet. Holy The <laughs> saw itself is very impressive, and it's very dangerous. It's just like a shark's tooth sticking out sideways. Oh my gosh. Wow. He is amazing. Oh my god. Uh -oh. The anglers know they must release the sawfish swiftly and safely without landing it. But to do it, they have to tangle with its weapon. I touched them, Matt. Here, here's these pliers, Jess. Hand them the pliers. Matt grabs a pair of pliers and gets as close to the sawfish as he dares. Cut that, you know, use the side thing. Jessica and Eddie watch Matt's every move. I didn't want nobody to get hurt, so it was very, very scary. Matt targets the fishing line at the base of the saw blade. With a fast flick, he severs the line. Good release. This guy's gonna go live another hundred years. Oh my god! I don't even know. The sawfish swims free. Oh my god. Holy cow. Oh my god. The coolest thing about catching a sawfish is to let it go and watch it swim away. That is the coolest thing. For the three anglers, battling the prehistoric predator was unforgettable. Few people on Earth have ever seen a sawfish or its phenomenal weapon in the wild. Today, the remarkable rare encounter serves as a reminder of the ultimate challenge of man versus weapon wielding fish. Human development, climate change, overfishing, and pollution threaten these amazingly adapted alpha hunters. So the key to saving these remarkably designed fish is doing research to figure out what the problems are, what's impacting them, driving their numbers down, and then saving their habitat so they have a place to live, and then trying to put into play some type of regulations to curb overfishing so that we're not overharvesting them. Only through continued research, habitat conservation, and sustainable fishing can we save some of evolution's most incredible killer adaptations and the water's most amazing predators. It's hooked deadly weapons.